Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll meet a Poetry Out Loud competitor from Cavalier, North Dakota. But first, joining me now is the Director of Television for Prairie Public Broadcasting, Bob Dambeck. Bob, thanks for joining us Well, today. it's great. I always love to talk about Prairie Public, John, <laughs> so uh, I'm glad to be here to do that. Well, you're here today to talk about Prairie Public and uh, celebrating its 50th year in business, uh, its 50th anniversary, and uh, we're going to get into that. But before we do, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, your background, where you're originally from. Well, I grew up in New Jersey, and then I went to college in Dayton, Ohio, and then graduate study at the University of Iowa, all in communications and television. Have basically worked in public television or radio most of my career. After that, I, a graduation in 75 from University of Iowa, I worked and lived in Florida, Pennsylvania, Kansas, and then uh, Las Vegas before I came up in 1984 to uh, Prairie Public. Well, and of course, you gave us the, the years there, but so how did you end up uh, coming to Prairie Public? Well, uh, my wife and I were both recruited by Dennis Falk. Uh, more my wife than me, but uh, I came along for the ride. And uh, we arrived here in Labor Day of 1984. Dennis took us, uh, actually came in the Bismarck. We drove across the state when the sunflowers were blooming, um, which was a wonderful sight. We drove down 8th Street in Fargo and saw all the trees. And as I mentioned, we were from Las Vegas. So um, I think the landscape made as big a impact on us as the job offer. So uh, we came up here and actually arrived in the middle of a blizzard uh, last day of November 1984. And we're stranded in a hotel room for the first two days with 20 below weather. So we stayed. So that showed some perseverance there. Well, it did. Yeah, okay, so Prairie Public is celebrating 50 years, I guess in 1964, January the 19th, I believe, was the first television broadcast, but how did Prairie Public get its start? Well, in the late uh, 1950s, Dr. Ted Donay um, had visited the public television station in Minneapolis, and he came back with a saying, and it was, why not Fargo? If Minneapolis can have a public TV station, why not Fargo? In 1959, he actually organized the Prairie Public. It wasn't called Prairie Public back then. It was the North Dakota Education Association, something like that. Um, and they had the mission to try to get public TV on the air. Well, they sputtered along for a number of years. And then finally, in 1991, excuse me, 1961, they got a $50,000 grant from the North Dakota legislature. They used half of it for a feasibility study, the other half to buy the first transmitter. Um, they, once again, were raising money, trying to raise money. WDAY came along and donated our first facility, which was down in South Fork, south near Rose Creek, where it is today, on the river. We were at the base of their transmitter, basically in their transmitter building. So we had a location. 1963, uh, Claire Tetmer, the first uh, general manager, was hired. And uh, they thought they were going to go on the air earlier. But they actually announced that they thought they'd be on in, in November of 1963. Well, that date slid to December. Then they announced January 5th. And finally, uh, it was on the 19th that it went on the air. And for the next couple years, I think the, the thing that happened the most was, how do we raise enough money to keep this thing afloat? They thought they uh, needed about $100,000 a year each year to um, keep Prairie Public on the air, uh, keep KFME, I should say, on the air, which is we were one station back then. And it was a constant struggle. Um, they, in the 60s, didn't have much of a program schedule. They um, broadcast in the, originally for 27 and a half hours a week. They had a schedule in the morning that was, uh, actually the afternoon, I should say, from 1 to 3, that was for educational programs. And then from 6.30 to 10 at night for what we, we see now, a lot of nature and science programming. And that meant there were no programs on the weekend. There were no programs in the morning. They would just sign on at those times. They would stop in the afternoon and wait until it was time to uh, broadcast the evening schedule. Uh, there were a couple local productions. They um, got some equipment. Actually, in 67, they started with some color cameras. And they had a little facility down, once again, at South Fork. And uh, the first uh, program they produced was a 60-hour um, English literature course with uh, Concordia College. And then uh, the second program, that was in 1964-65. And then in 66, they produced a program called 
Rev Red River Land, which was a history of the Red River Valley. And interesting enough, they used very uh, puppets and little props. Those puppets and props are now over at the Clay County Historical Society in Moorhead. There's a display of them if anyone wants to go over and see them. Well, okay, Bob. So, yeah, in 64, of course, education was probably the root of what public uh, broadcasting was, was uh, founded on. And then, of course, PBS came along with Sesame Street, Electric Company, and, and other programs. Is that what kind of help television find its way? Well, uh, from the very beginning, they thought that the funding mechanism for Prairie Public would be they would charge a service to the schools that were using it. Uh, Fargo Public Schools came on board at the very beginning and, and were paying a per head charge, if you would, for students. But uh, with the coverage area and with the, the state of education and funding for education, they never got enough money from the students they were serving and the schools they were serving to really meet all the costs that were associated with the broadcast and the staffing of Prairie Public. In 1967, uh, the Public Broadcasting Act was passed. Corporation for Public Broadcasting was formed, and they got a huge influx of money uh, when they, when we qualified for the federal money that first time, $134,000, which was, as I mentioned, more money than they thought it would require each year to run. So uh, that was a big year for Prairie Public in 67, 68, when they first the corporation was founded, and then 68 when they when they got the money. Okay. Were there any other transitions you could talk about? Let's say in the in the late 60s and into the 70s. Yeah, um, I think the biggest one was 1971. In 1971, um, long time, uh, general manager and president Dennis Falk came here. Uh, Dennis was here for about 23 years and oversaw the build out of the entire Prairie Public Network. And uh, the, well, the real, he really worked hard to get state funding from North Dakota for uh, this organization. He also was very involved with getting uh, state funding from Minnesota to be part of uh, our funding mix here. Well, and we'll talk about the coverage area a little bit later on, but, and then of course you came on board in about 1985, and what was the station like at that time? Well, if you were to go and look back, I came right at the end of what had to be their biggest transition, maybe even bigger than us going to digital a couple years ago and with our high de definition. Uh, during the time period of 1977 to about 1985, um, Prairie Public, Four times went to the legislature to try to get funding. Um, the third time they went, they lost by one vote. Uh, it was actually a tie, but one of our former board members was then the lieutenant governor who breaks the ties, I guess, and he had to excuse himself from voting. So it was even closer than that. In 1977, we first got money, uh, a large amount of money from the state of North Dakota, and that money was not for operation. It was for building out the system to build at that time four television stations in the western western part of the state. Um, public radio wasn't part of the mix at that time, but between 1977 and 1985, we built four TV stations. Um, they started public radio, got a building in, in Bismarck. This building we're in today was purchased and then renovated during that time period. One of the transmitters that we put up went down in an ice storm and had to be rebuilt during that <clears throat> during that time period. They started some local production. We really hadn't had a lot of local production before that. So um, they were involved with a lot of things, a lot of building projects and uh, have that accomplished at the same time. So they got funding from the state of North Dakota in 77. By the, the next legislative round, it was cut in half. And that was the same time the national funding to the stations was cut in half as well. So as the funding was going down, well, um, you know, the building came up. And the other part of it was that we had to look for new revenue. That's when charitable came, gaming came um, on board. And that's when they, we did the ramp up for uh, the revenue we received from uh, charitable gaming at that time. A busy, busy period for Prairie Public. So I arrived at the end of this. And so most of this has been built. And what we realized was we had no money to produce local programming. We barely had enough money to um, purchase the, the programs that we got from PBS. We had to cut down. We could not get the entire PBS package. We had to drop the news hour for a number of years because the financial situation was was that bad in the 84, 85, 86. Hmm. Well, and then 
Of course, pledge drives. Now people associate public uh, broadcasting with pledge drives. Why and how were they, uh, when did they come along? Well, there's a little bit of history here. Um, first thing that happened in 1963, right before they went on the air, Prairie Public needed some money. So they um, were sent out appeals, letter appeals, paper appeals, and in them they said that this was the last time they would be asking for money basically from the public. So um, for a number of years when they had to go back and ask for money, not on the air, but, but uh, behind the scenes, the, the Fargo Forum, some other papers would run this as a headline, you know, that they had said they weren't raising, asking for money and now they were asking for money again. 1971, Dennis Falk gets here. He's here for a couple months um, and realizes that unless we get $44,000 like in the next 10 days, they'd have to shut down Prairie Public. They'd have to lock the doors. So he went on the air and it wasn't the first time anyone went on the air in public broadcasting, but it was the first time here. And he went on the air, and the next six days they managed to raise $44,000. Uh, that was the first one, 1971. Uh, during the late 60s and early 70s, uh, we did an auction. And the auction was very successful, but what happened was when we, um, let me see, and when we added Grand Forks and we added Winnipeg, uh, through cable uh, from Grand Forks. In, uh, at that time, we had to realize we had to drop the auction because we couldn't get the product into Canada. People would bid on stuff and we couldn't get it there. And it just became, it was costing more money than the station was making. So that was 75. And then in 75, we started doing the pledge drives, the on-air appeals that you um, see today. And actually, even back then, we were doing a little less uh, as the amount of days we're on the air, but not a lot. Yeah, it's pretty much stayed the same. Stayed the same. Yeah. Uh, so, how has Prairie Public stayed relevant over the years? Well, I think um, one of the things has to be our children's programming. Beyond a doubt, uh, we provide the best children's programming and have since 1970 when Sesame Street went on the air, 71 Electric Company, Mr. Rogers had been on the air before that. I should mention, we got our programming in the early days. We didn't get inter interconnected to anyone until 1966 when we had a wire basically going to Minneapolis and Minneapolis and Prairie Public could trade programs. The other way was we would get tapes sent to us in the mail. We'd be waiting for delivery and sometimes the tapes didn't come on time, so the schedule wouldn't, wouldn't be able to be met. It, when that happened, John, at that time in the early years, when those, a program didn't get here on time, uh, or, or the school programs that we ran during the day went short, they had an uh, aquarium with fish and gravel. They had a camera on it and a clock in the background. So you could see when the time for the next program might be coming on, or this was instead of dead air, you would see the fish swimming around on, on, on this These are live fish? Live fish and <laughs> live TV, yep. Okay, yeah. so any, anyway, um, the other part, so the children's programming was important. Our educational programming have been important throughout Prairie Public's history. We started, started really as educational TV, it wasn't until the 70s when we were called Public TV and then Prairie Public Broadcasting came along as a title. Um, but we were education and we, it changed over the years the way it looks, but we have maintained that over the 30 years that I've been here and even increased it. Uh, one of the things that our education department jumped on quite early was the online components. So we have been doing that for a long time, providing resources for the teachers in the area online. Uh, when we talk about some of our locally produced programs, um, we, we have produced a number of educational programs that actually have been used nationally. Not broadcast programs, but programs to be distributed directly to school classrooms. Yeah. Well, and speaking of uh, programs, uh, I know the TV department under your leadership has produced some wonderful documentaries uh, talking about the arts, history, and culture of our region. How do these come about and how do they get started? Well, there's a little bit of history on that one, too. I mentioned earlier that we, we really weren't into a lot of local production when I came here. Uh, there were a couple programs that had been here and had left, Skylines and Spin, there were two of them. We had Boyd Christian's interviews. Mm -hmm. But in 1990-91, um, we went out and we um, applied for money for three different programs. One of them was Prairie News Journal which was on the air for a number of years here. Another one was the Star Schools Initiative, which was our Spanish language programming, Hablamos Espanol. And another one was a 
Agriculture Department, U.S. Department of Agriculture demonstration grant, pilot programs looking at, um, for us, looking at uh, entrepreneurship, small business. We had Prairie Town meetings as part of that. Well, I remember Larry White, my boss at the time, turning to me, and I was both in charge of programming and production at the time. He said, Bob, one of these would be great, but hell would break loose if we get all three. Well, we got all three, and it, it really changed the way what Prairie Public was doing. We became a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day operation, producing stuff for Prairie News Journal, for the weekly show, um, the Ag Grant shows, and the daily Spanish shows. One time we produced three daily Spanish shows, four actually broadcast, because Spanish One was broadcast twice, originating by satellite here, beamed directly to schools, uh, all across the country, and it was always a little comical for me that we were providing Spanish teachers and Spanish lessons for people in South Texas, uh, where you would think, you know, finding a Spanish teacher would be an easy thing to do. But that, that program lasted for almost 10 years, uh, Prairie News Journal about eight years, and the, the demonstration project with different programs involved with it lasted in, into... Uh, well, until about five or six years ago. So uh, these were things we did. But in 1996, Kathleen Pavelko came on board as the GM. And one of the first things she did was come down and say, you know, Bob, you've done Pyramids on the Prairie, a really nice half-hour show, won, won awards. You've done um, uh, Mennonites of Manitoba. You've done the Germans from Ur in the process of doing the first Germans from Russia show. And what I want you to concentrate on now is one hour, single series, single part, documentaries about the history, arts, and culture of the region. So um, that, that was a large task, but we were fortunate that we were able to find multiple partners throughout the region, and that's what makes these local, you know, we've won Emmy Awards, we've won Tele Awards, numerous awards that we've won is because of the partners we've been able to establish with people like Michael Miller up at the NDSU and, and, and the Germans from Russia collection. Um, the people at the North Dakota Council on the Arts, the Humanities, up at uh, the ERC. We've done a number of projects with the ERC on uh, environmental related topics. We've done partnerships with Ducks Unlimited, both the U.S. and Canada, and I'm sure I'm leaving out Minot some. State University. Minot State yeah. University yeah. On, on the meth, meth project. So um, the partners that we have had over the years, Winnipeg Foundation, another one, have, have really made it possible. And lately, the money we get from the Minnesota uh, Heritage Funding has made uh, the amount of programs we can produce uh, in Minnesota really, really, uh, they're important and they're made possible by those partnerships. Well, Bob, you know, we don't have a lot of time here and I've got a, a lot of questions I'd like to ask you, but you know, there have been legislative efforts over the year to defund public television and, and just go commercial. You know, why, why is it important to keep the public in public television? Well, I think because of the track record of what we see when um, the, the wonderful cable and satellite has come on board and we were supposed to watch this blossoming of arts programming and children's programming. And in honesty, it really hasn't happened. Places like arts and entertainment started out that way, but they, they have drifted because they can make more money doing the other types of programming. Um, program, can you imagine Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers broken up by commercials for toys? Uh, that's just not what we're about. And who else? The local news stations do a great job of covering topical day-to-day -day news. No one else in the region is providing the in-depth documentaries about topics, about history, uh, things that really are important and involve all of us in this region. What's the best part about working at Prairie Public? Um, I tell my wife that when I was in graduate school, if I could have designed my ideal job, well, that's what I have here and have here for well over 30 years now. Um, people like John, the general managers, have really given the support to the local programming. And I enjoy the great programs that we get from PBS, but I really enjoy the fact that we're able to produce hours and hours and hours of programming about the region each and every year. Well, Bob, if people want more information, where can they go? Well, they can go to our website, www.prairiepublic.org. If you have a question about programming, call Steve Wenblum, our program manager. And uh, if you're on that website, you can find the toll-free number that can get you there. I'm sure we'll put it up on the screen. Bob, thanks for joining us Thank today. you, John. Stay tuned for more. Poetry Out Loud is a contest that encourages the nation's youth to learn about great poetry. This program helps students master public speaking skills, build self-confidence, and learn about their literary heritage. 
Bethany Brumbaugh of Cavalier High School was a finalist in North Dakota's 2013 State Poetry Out Loud competition. Throughout her competition, she learned more about poetry and herself. Poetry Out Loud is a high school competition where students pick a piece of poetry, memorize it, but also learn what it means and learn how to say it, how the author would have liked it to be said. It all starts at the classroom level. Your teacher approves a poem that you pick and you recite your poem for your class. And then the winner of the classroom competition goes to the school competition. And they pick one winner out of all the classroom competitions to represent the school at the state competition. They have a website, poetryoutloud.org. They have a database of a whole bunch of eligible poems. You had to have one that had 25 lines and fewer, and then you also had to have one that was pre-18th century. There are hundreds and hundreds of poems that you can pick on that database, and through all those I found three that really stuck out to me. You look at the author's perspective and not take everything so literal because a lot of poetry isn't very literal. You have to look at the imagery behind it and keep in mind that things aren't so concrete in poetry. It is like artwork, abstract artwork. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering va and vast, out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land. While I was performing my poems, I felt very, very nervous. The state competition is the worst for that just because the lights are dimmed low and you have the spotlight and there are all these really good competitors. So it's more nerve wracking that way. But it was kind of cool at the same time that I had reached that level and that people were listening to me because they thought that I was good. Before I entered Poetry Out Loud, I had this idea that poetry was kind of unreachable and ununderstandable. I didn't really see it as any type of art, but now I can really see how poets really create this piece that really is art. It's something so beautiful. Sometimes I say, I'm going to meet my sister at the cafe, even though I have no sister, just because it's such a beautiful thing to say. I've always thought so ever since I read a novel in which two sisters were constantly meeting in cafes. Today, for example, I walked alone on the wet sidewalk, wearing my rain boots, expecting someone might ask where I was headed. I would encourage other students to participate in Poetry Out Loud because you get in touch with yourself in a whole new way. I gained a new perspective on learning in life, more confidence in who I am. If I wouldn't have done Poetry Out Loud, I probably would have regretted it. The first poem was Batter My Heart, Three-Person God by John Dunn. I wanted to have one that incorporated my faith. It's a man who is pouring out his heart to God and he's very frustrated because he has no control over giving his whole heart to the Lord. We are in the back of my Grandma Shirley's yard and I chose this location because the beauty in this area reminds me of the beauty that I see in the poem. Batter My Heart, Three-Person God by John Donne. Batter my heart, three-person God. For you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend. That I may rise and stand, or throw me, and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, 
like a usurped town to another do, labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. Reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captived and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you, and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie or break that knot again, take me to you, imprison me, for I except you enthrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public.